That was so fancy. That was really fancy. Oh my goodness. I feel so cool. Hi. <laughs> hello. It is, it is so nice to see you. And, and I want to say hello and welcome to everyone near and far who is joining us tonight at this Barnes and Noble virtual event. Um, I'm really excited to see you. It's really nice to see an unfamiliar face. Um, and we have so much to talk about. Before we start talking about that, though, I wanted to make sure I get the housekeeping details up and out before I forget them. Um, those of you who have uh, ordered signed books, they, those will be shipped out after tonight's event. You can expect to get them in the next eight to 10 days. Um, those of you who have put questions into the Q&A, thank you very much. I promise I will look at them and we'll try to answer some of them. And, um, and those of you who have put your questions into the chat, I am not going to see those. They go by much too fast. So if you have a question and you'd like uh, Victoria to take a look at it and or me to ask her, will you please make sure you put it in the Q&A. Now, um, I am, as many of you know, Megan Whalen Turner, the author of the Queen's Thief books, and I am here tonight to talk to V. Schwab. V. Schwab is <laughs> the number one New York Times best-selling author of more than 20 books, those books range in audience from young to old. Um, they include the highly acclaimed Shades of Magic, um, the Villain series, uh, Archived, Cassidy Blake, uh, and the international bestseller, The Invisible Life of Abby LaRue. But we're here tonight to talk about V.E. Schwab's newest book, Gallant. So just to open this up, Victoria, if you would like to tell us about Gallant yes. and, um, and how you came to write this book during a pandemic, because I think a lot of us are not getting a lot of writing done during that. Yeah, that is the thing that makes you realize how long we've been in this pandemic, is that I started writing Gallant during the pandemic, and it has come out during the pandemic. And that is like, I only know how to measure time in books anyway. So this is very surreal. Let me just say thank you. Um, so much for having this conversation with me. I am such a huge fan. So this is like, I'm just giddy. I'm so glad to be here. This, this is like fan to fan here. Yes, I'm very oh. excited. Oh man. Well, I, I'm thrilled. I, um, I just wanted to also say I signed everyone's books today for this event. So literally I was in the Barnes and Noble and I hand signed and personalized every single every single book. So if you're waiting on your book, it was, you're waiting on me to go in there and sign it today. But no, for Gallant, um, you know, it's interesting. I often talk about my stories as having a really long steep time. So even though I draft novels fairly quickly, once I start drafting them, I tend to think about books for a very long time, maybe, you know, anywhere from one to 10 years <laughs> with Abby LaRue, it was 10. With most books, it's one to four. Um, and with Gallant, it was four. And one of the reasons being that I had this idea for a house and a garden wall and a door and a door that, you know, was locked and that led somewhere. And for years, I tried to write a fairy tale. I kept looking at all of the ingredients in this meal, all of the pieces of this puzzle. And they said, oh, well, this is a fairy tale. I know these pieces, this wild and this domestic and this, this fey element. And every time I sat down to write a fairy tale, my brain said, this is not a fairy tale. You have to figure out what this is, but it's not a fairy tale. Like I love fairy tales. And I think of like Holly Black as like kind of the queen of the modern fairy tales. But I kept trying to look through the garden wall at Gallant and find a forest, find a fey court, find all of these things that just weren't me. And then one day about three and a half years into the, you know, trying and failing to start writing this novel, it's like I turned it over in my hands and I realized, oh, I'm not writing a fairy tale. I'm writing a death tale. I'm writing an underworld tale. I'm writing, and then as soon as I thought about it that way, as soon as I thought about it as an underworld tale, I was like, I know how to write this book. And so I sat down and I started to write a book about like so many of my books about the line between life and death 
and loneliness and family and identity and hope and voice and what came out was gallant. That is just amazing. And, and do, you, do you always need to find a, like a model, a, an identity for a book before you start writing? Is it like, this yeah. is a fairy tale, this is a dystopia, this is a multiverse? No. Interestingly, no, it's not that I usually need a category. Mm -hmm. It's that for this story, usually I think of all my books as a meal. And like I mentioned before, I'm looking for the ingredients that go into the meal. And I was looking at the ingredients for this meal and I assumed that these ingredients made a fairy tale. They seemed like the kind of pieces that made a fairy tale. So it was more that I, less that I needed the shape of it and more that I knew I had the wrong shape. Uh -huh. I was like, oh, these ingredients should add up to this, but they don't, they don't want to. It wouldn't have been the right thing that I wanted to eat. Somebody else would have made that fairy tale and it would have been delicious, but I wouldn't have enjoyed eating it. And like, as the writer, right, we're the first reader. We're the ones who live with a story for so long before it ever goes to someone else. I was like, I don't want to eat this. <laughs> but you know, it's the thing that I want to eat. And then, so that's really what it was. I do always know the endings for better or worse. I've never written a book that I didn't know the ending for, but I usually don't need to know where it's going to sit, what kind of story it's going to be. It's just with this one, it's because I kept going down the wrong path. Okay. And, and does that mean that, you know, when you're starting out with a book, whether you're going to pitch the text towards middle grade or, or towards adult, or does that sort of happen organically as you're writing? I mean, look, it would be a lie if I said I didn't have an awareness of it because like we are writers, but we're also authors. And like authors is like the job title that understands that there's a publishing industry and that you are going to have a book that sits on a shelf somewhere. And I, I can't pretend like I don't understand how a bookstore is shaped. But um, for many years that felt like a thing that I wrote in spite of, not for. Like I understood that my book was gonna have to go on a shelf. So I picked, and, and it's a luxury of success. I, I will tell anyone that listens, I don't think I would have been allowed to write Gallant in traditional publishing um, in the shape that it is at the beginning of my career. But I wrote it after Addie LaRue. And I went to my editor, Martha at Harper at, after Addie, as I was working on the story and I said, okay, don't kill me, but like, I kind of want to write a story that is an all ages book. Mm -hmm. And I want it to have elements of middle grade and elements of YA and elements of adult. I want it to have illustrations that are integral to the story. And I, I want to be able to have the freedom that when I hit those roads where I understand what would make it concretely middle grade or concretely YA or concretely adult, I don't have to take the road for the sake of taking it. I can take the road for the story that I want to tell. I think that's I wonderful. That I, I let me just jump in here and say, yeah. that is one of the things that I love about this oh, book oh, is exactly you. that, is that it has a sort of old world feel in, in your text. Um, and it has that kind of expectation, I think, of the reader that they can level up. That, that this is a book that isn't going to say you belong in this category or that category. No, 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 This is not a book that's categorized by the age level as much as by the, the style, yeah. by the content, by the way the story goes. It's, do you like this kind of story? Because if you like this kind of story, you're really gonna love Gallant. Oh, it's exactly. That's what, that's what I wanted to do because I think coming off of, you know, People forget, you mentioned at the beginning in my bio, bios always make me cringe because I'm like, ew, don't say nice things. I understand that they're written for that. But, yes. but like so many, what I've discovered over the last 20 books is that like I, my readership doesn't have an age. That, and I think that the more books I publish and the more I see my readers, the more I realize that books are like puzzles, right? Sometimes they have a lower age threshold. It's an mm -hmm. eight plus, a 10 plus, but no upper age threshold. And I think we come back to books at different times in our life and we experience them completely differently. So I hate this idea that like, oh, well, YA only goes up to 18 or middle grade only goes up to 13. I'm like, no, go back when you're 50 and 70 and hundred and you're gonna experience that book completely differently. I, I think there's a reason we're both here tonight. 
<laughs> and, and, and I think it's because we see this very much the same way that, yeah. um, you know, when, when people ask me, do you think my, my kid would like this book? Um, I, I always say, if, if they like this kind of book, it doesn't really matter how old they are. They'll like this book. Exactly. Um, and, and a lot of my readers are adults. So, and, and I think that's one of the things I loved about Addie LaRue um, and, um, and about Gallant, which is just uh, thank you. splendid. But you said you had the, that you have the house, you got the portal, the portal to somewhere else, the door in the, in the back. Um, I wanted to ask you about some of your influences because I think I saw that, that you described this book as the secret garden crossed with Crimson Peak. It's exactly. <laughs> which, I, which I think really does hit the nail on the head. But um, I, wanna, I wanna talk about how much I love your orphan, oh. Olivia. Um, she is not a Oliver Twist kind of super vulnerable orphan. Um, and I was thinking very much Jane Eyre Yes. When, when I was reading and I wondered if, if you had Jane, what orphans you had in mind, um, Secret Garden makes yeah. me think of Mary Mary Quite Contrary. Um, what, what were your influences? I think, I mean, this is always very tricky because yes, like it's easy in retrospect to go back and say, oh yeah, this character has a little bit of this and a little bit of that. When I'm writing them though, this comes from the fact that whenever I'm writing um, a character of a specific age, I'm just writing for myself at that age. So not that I'm writing me, Olivia is not me, but she's who I would have needed to see at 16. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, Olivia is extremely angry and she's nonverbal. And I think a lot of the exploration of the story is that we make sure that like not spoken doesn't equal silent. There's nothing silent about Olivia Pryor. And I think a lot, like, I think a lot about when I was a teenager, I was closeted. I, I wasn't just closeted though. Like I didn't know I was gay. And so what happened was I spent a lot of my teen years feeling like I didn't have the vocabulary even speak in the same language as the world around me. I just felt like I couldn't find the words. I couldn't find the translation. And so it was such an incredibly lonely and isolating experience that I think a lot of my teen protagonists, especially Olivia, is about the loneliness that comes from feeling like you're not being heard or mm -hmm. understood or seen. And so I think I, you know, she's obviously very angry. She's very strong. She came with the story. Like I didn't build her. Some, most of my characters I build, but I don't feel like I built Olivia Pryor. I feel like usually my characters, they grow out of a specific scene. Like almost like I have a context and then they show me how they behave in the context. And there's a scene where Olivia is learning to play the piano. And the, like her relationship to the piano and like finding an instrument that finally starts to speak to her and then to excel at it and to essentially be told no and to be cut off from the piano. This happens in like the very beginning chapter. So I don't consider this a spoiler. And she <laughs> considers destroying the piano. She goes in in the dead of night with like shears and considers cutting the piano strings and, and can't bring herself to do it. So it's not the piano's fault. And, um, and that just that like push pull tension of anger at the world and like the desire for an anchor within that world was kind of the scene that helped me understand Olivia. I loved the scenes where she wants to express herself and can't do it verbally and is able to come up with her very own means of communicating, yeah. usually by smashing things. Yeah. I mean, I, it's by like being loud, right? By making- yeah. By being more. very loud and, yeah. and um, impossible to overlook. You yeah. know, she asserts so strongly her rights to yeah. be seen mm -hmm. um, and recognized and uh, respected. Absolutely, especially because if you think about it, you know, as a character who relies on sign language, when she's lucky enough to find people who speak sign language, they still, all they have to do is turn their back on her in order to end the conversation. And so I think that like need to make a mess to try and make noise is that that's the version of a shout in verbal, you know, parlance. Like that's her way of saying like, no, you don't get to turn your back on this. You don't get to ignore this. Right, right. So um, you mentioned 
the artwork. And I, I think you sort of answered my question before I even had a chance to ask it. You had the artwork in mind as you were writing. Yeah, it's, um, it's integral. Can you tell me about that process, about imagining the visual as you were writing text and then meeting yeah. the artist and seeing the artist's interpretation of your work? Because I, so I, the it's pictures like are amazing. It's a creative amazing. trust fall, right? It's a creative trust fall. Like it's these stories, like these, I keep getting asked from like international readers, oh, will the foreign editions have the art? And I'm like, the art is an entire part of the story. Like, but, but, but because I'm not the artist, I mean, I literally, so I wrote didactics. I wrote, I essentially titled the eight pieces of art mm -hmm. and I described in, in as much kind of like flowery aura detail as possible what they needed to contain mm -hmm. and then that's what got given to Manuel the artist and and then it kind of became a conversation right though I mean really he nailed it like I saw the sketches and then I saw the finished work so I was able to weigh in at the sketches but these pieces are so integral to the story I've never in my life handed over a creative element like I've done comics and so you have a creative conversation but at the end of the day, like I had to trust in Manuel's ability to create and convey not only the content, but the style. It was terrifying. Like I getting those files was one of the scariest moments because I knew the whole story would have to be rewritten if, if the illustrations didn't work. Like I, I could not really find a way to extricate the two. And that's one of the reasons I had a really long conversation with my editor before I even went down this plot side because I was like, I need to know if it's not possible, if it's not in the budget, if it's not gonna be doable because the book that I'm writing will mandate at least eight illustrations. Wow, how, how what foresight you have <laughs> to have had that conversation before you started writing into, instead of after yeah. you had a finished product. I had, two. I had two conversations that had to happen. One was the art and one was the perspective. I usually write uh, books for younger readers from a first person perspective, but I knew that if I did that, it would have an audio book. If it had an audio book from the first person perspective, somebody would be narrating Olivia's voice. And I couldn't have that. Even to the point where when we picked an audio book narrator, I said, it has to be a man, preferably like classic fairy tale man, because I don't want anyone to conflate the voice that they're hearing with Olivia because that's a supplement. That's like, that's not fair to her as a character at all. Oh, that was brilliant. And, and really just wonderful because of course she has a very strong voice. Absolutely. She may not be um, expressing that voice verbally and aloud where her other characters can hear her, but she has a very distinctive voice from the very minute that you start to be aware of her thoughts. Um, and, and, and I loved the way you have a voice for her in this book, that it, it is her voice mm -hmm. because it is her perspective um, and she is articulating so often the things that are going on around her. And um, I'll have to listen to the audiobook. I know I haven't gotten to hear the whole thing yet. I've only gotten to hear like the part of it. And so I, and I usually am very phobic about listening to my books on audio because I just think you find that it creates like a very strange dissonance. I've never listened to my audiobooks. I've really? listened to, to little pieces of the audiobooks. Really? And, and then I, I just turn it off. I, Hard. And it is so uncanny valley, yes. disturbing to hear my words in somebody else's voice. Yes. Yeah. I so agree completely. I people will, ask I will me if I like my audio books and I say, the parts I've heard are wonderful. Exactly. And, I, and I do think that Steve West um, did a brilliant job uh, with the HarperCollins audio books, uh, but I, Still have not been able to make myself listen to the whole book. I understand. Yeah. I understand. Um, so final question. The names. I, the names in your books are so significant. I mean, the the invisible life of Addie LaRue, who, who spends centuries in regret, you know, obviously you're thinking very carefully about your names. Can you tell me 
at what point in the process do you have the name? Um, and and with gallant, that's a word yeah. that throughout the book, the word has so many different meanings in this book. It's a house, it's a family, it's a character trait. What does gallant mean? What well, does it mean like, to you? I mean, for me, it means this house, which is confusing because I understand that gallant is a, is a, a descriptor is an adjective and I'm known for doing this because like I, the near witch is set in near like I just I like words that are disorienting I wanted to have I want to have a really satisfying answer for you because normally I have very satisfying answers for the names I don't like sometimes I put a word in my back pocket because I like the way it sounds I come from a poetry background and sometimes I just like the invisible life of Addie LaRue that has a cadence it mm -hmm. has a flow it has a really soft sibilance to it. And I think with Gallant, I saw it in my mind on a, like on the archway, on the sign. And I like, I needed a word that meant multiple things because she's been warned, Olivia has been warned in her journal that she will be safe, safe as long as she stays away from Gallant. And so I needed it to be a word that doesn't fit. That word is perpendicular to its context. You're like, okay, well, Gallant, you know, it can mean a kind of person, but also like, what is it? So I need you to not assume that it's a place. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you, it's one of those, I, I tend to be like the God of my own world. I tend to know exactly where the origins of everything comes from for me. Gallant was always the name of this estate. It just, like they were just together. I will say with characters like Olivia, Olivia was not her original name, but I could not start writing her until I had her name. So I had the bones of the story. I had my outline, um, but I could not actually start the first chapter until I had the right name. And there are many emails that go back and forth between friends, publicists, editor, agent, where I'm trying to find. I knew her last name was Pryor, but I mean, I went through, I tested them. It's almost like I put them on her like coat and I would write a scene with the name and I would be like, it's not right. It's not right. And Olivia has like that little edge to it. It just has a little like a little sharpness in the V that I liked. Wow. It's really wonderful hearing you talk about these things. <laughs> um, I didn't think about, you know, the sharpness of the V in the middle. I, I, I thought more about the fact that she had live yeah. as part of her name That's and true. that she had such a strong desire yeah. to live a life, you know, to, to be free from the, the orphanage at the beginning and to establish herself in a home and have a life and to live. Um, and I thought Gallant was such a fabulous name because, and I don't want to get into any spoilers, but the behavior of the family, yeah. you know, that she finds in this estate um, yeah. raises real questions about what's the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do and what sacrifices we make and what sacrifices we should be asked to make um, and whether those sacrifices in the end are going to be worthwhile. And I think all of that was so beautifully encapsulated in, in the name of the estate. Maybe Olivia, like, I mean, maybe I, your answer is so much better than mine, which is just that, like, I wanted something timeless. And I think, you know, names also tend to, like, get locked into a time period. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted a very classic name, but also not a hyper feminine name. I tend to, like, always try to find some names that, like, have, again, like I say, that edge to them. But I always just mean the edge in how they sound. Like, someone is saying her name at all times with sharpness in mm -hmm. their voice. But I think you're right. There's also, I mean, Olivia in many ways walks the line between life and death. And so she is tethered verbally, semantically. To, to a life. And, and you know, um, you, you said earlier that, um, that you can't start writing until you have certain pieces. Yeah. And, um, and I, I also find that that's true. One of my hangups is always the landscape. Yeah. Um, and, and that was my alarm reminding me <laughs> that, that we do have to take other questions. So is the of, landscape, your piece, is that the thing that like you need to have your, your terrain? Yes. I really, I could not start writing the story of the thief until I had found the location that I wanted to set it in. 
And all I really knew about the location was that I didn't want it to look like Middle Earth. Um, but every place you grew up, I think in Western Massachusetts? No, I grew up in Nashville. Nashville, okay. Well, Nashville also looks a lot like Middle Earth. Yes, and does. so does pretty much every place I grew up. And so when it came time to like tear myself out of the fantasy world of Middle Earth and imagine something else, I was stuck really until uh, I took a, a trip to Greece. Mm. And I realized that that landscape, absolutely no one would confuse that with Middle Earth. Uh, and it really called to me. And I could begin writing that story once I knew where it was set. A hundred percent. Place is so powerful. I just wanted to say like in many ways, Gallant is inspired. So I live in Scotland now mm -hmm. and Gallant is inspired by those kinds of like Scottish estates. Like I remember seeing Skyfall and they go in the James Bond film up to this massive Scottish estate in the middle of nowhere. And like, even though Gallant is a different shaped house, the house in Skyfall is just in this basin that's just got the mountain range to every side. It just seems like the end of the world and so lonely. That building looked so lonely to me that I was like, that. that that's that, it, that yeah. Energy. Yeah, well, that certainly came across. Now I'm gonna do the thing where I get a whole lot yeah, closer to the, to the computer screen. Sorry about the, uh, the, the frightening um, <laughs> close up here, but I can't otherwise see the, um, yeah, that's what I'll do. I'll just go like this. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to take a look at the questions. Yeah. Um, and we're going to ask for the ones that are on top. Um, so Catherine Goldberg says, of all your characters, which was the most fun for you to write? Ooh, um, the master of the house, who is probably one of the most fundamental characters in this book. And uh, I can't really say anything about him without it being slightly spoilery, except the the details of writing him he's so creepy and he's so eternal and one detail i will give is that he's he's missing pieces of himself so like his skin is missing in places and the bones show through and that really weirdly the master of the house knowing how i wanted to write him is also how i knew it wasn't going to be a more commercial YA novel. Because in a more commercial YA novel, I would have made the master of the house take the manifestation of like a really sexy teenage boy. <laughs> and I never wanted to. I kept trying to make him like um, a little bit more labyrinth, right? Like the seductor. But, but that's not what Olivia wants. And it's not what she needs. She wants family. She right. wants parental, you know, stand-ins. And so the master of the house becomes this very eerie dead thing yeah and the pieces um the 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 idea of pieces is a not to get too spoilery but it's people in pieces and and the master of the house with pieces and that <laughs> i can i can see how that would be fun yeah oh, he was he was delightful so um the characters and and I forgot to ask you before we started, we're gonna range all over all of your books. All that's over, okay, that's right? great. I've written okay. too many books. Yeah, okay. The characters in, villain, in the villain series have a wide range of powers. Bradley Lou wants to know which one power would you choose for yourself and why? Oh, easily. And I didn't give it to any of the characters in the villain series so far. Um, but Go I will, it. yeah, because there's a third book. So it goes vicious, vengeful, victorious. And so I, I reserve the right to use it still, but I've always wanted the ability to control time, but with the massive caveat that I'm not going to go backward. Because when we go backward, it's when we, it's when everything gets messy, everything gets squicky, but I just really want more time. So I want the ability to pause, slow down or speed up. I think we're soulmates because- and Just one more time. You yes. had just a year, just a year on pause. If, if I could just step away for two weeks to get something done and then come back to exactly the same point in time, I would ace all of my college exams. Oh, because I think what I fear in life is not, it's not, I just fear the, like, I'm never going to have enough time. So... I feel like we Geo need Grins would like to know if you could read any book over again for the first time, what would it 
B and why? Okay, so I'm, I feel like we're gonna, you and I are gonna disagree on this. I am a, I'm a heathen. I do not reread books ever. I have, I never, I've never reread a book. I think I have a fear because I know how that I will never live enough lifetimes to read all the books that are out there. And it's interesting because I like rewatch TV shows, but I think like, I think I always want it to be the first time when I read a book. To me, like that's the excitement. The excitement is in the discovery of it being the first time. I don't go back and relive the books. I just, I've never had the urge to do it. I don't, I, I'm, I think it's, I, I feel terrible saying that. But like, I love having- I'm horrified. Them. I know, I know, I know. I'm so sorry. But, 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 but I'm, I'm rereading Gallon. Yeah. And I'm enjoying every little verbal interplay so here it's that's so going to foreshadow stuff no. that happened that I didn't see the, you know, know, maybe, I know. maybe I read say, more carefully than I do. No, because, well, so here's a weird thing. I have like, it's not an eidetic memory, but it's close to anything that I've ever read. So, I and I, it applies to my own writing even more. Like if I've written it, like I can, I can remember most of my books almost word for word, uh, which is daunting, but I, I do, I don't feel like I miss a lot. Mm-hmm. I'm sure I would love rereading, but the whole time I would be rereading the book, I would be thinking about my, my to read stack and things that I'm excited to read and how I don't have enough. To, so I feel like it's my own guilt that is, is like creating an inability for me to enjoy the rereading process. Well, and also it sounds like maybe you get what you need maybe. when so. you go through the first time, which yeah, maybe I'll try rereading something. I always say I will. But... I don't know. I think trust your gut. Yeah. If you're happy, you're happy. I am. I yeah. am. Um, yeah, yeah. Don't read books I, you don't want to read. Like, I do feel like a monster though. <laughs> I will say, just I just want everyone to know I'm aware of the monstrosity. Just an outlier. Let's no. let's not be pejorative here no, no, about differences. Yeah. And let's see. Um, My face is gonna hurt from smiling. <laughs> Life anymore. Lauren Van Dolan asks. I'm sorry. I probably mispronounced her name. You both write terrific characters. Which character that the other wrote do you wish you had written? I mean, you, I know it's a cheap answer for me to say Eugenides, but like, Genes- he's truly one of my favorite characters in fiction. So I don't think I could have done him justice, but I but and, I, and I really love Daddy LaRue. Oh. And I don't know that I could have done her justice but um, but I think if I picked one, it would probably be hard to pick one. Um, but yeah, let's go. <laughs> let's go with Addie. Lou. Genities and Addie. Yeah, because I I remember reading her and thinking um, that 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 I had not ever imagined writing anything quite like her, but that now that I'd seen it, I could. And I think that that's one of the best things about about writing is seeing things that that remind you, uh, or or seeing things that change your mind, mm-hmm. and suddenly you see things in a new way, and you could write things in a new way. And I've now gotten my second what heads up. Warning you. <laughs> yep. And yet, yeah, see, I'm very good. I set the alarms beforehand you because you lightly. and I could be here until eleven thirty and. Oh. There would be people in the background going, being like, I gotta go. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> so um, we're going to, let's see, let's do two more. And I think that you've sort of answered this question, but, uh, but the word choice is important. Okay. Um, was there anything specific that triggered the writing of this book? So did you ever have a sort of the penny drops, scales fall from your eyes, you wake up in the morning and you're like, now I write the book? Or was it more, you, I, I think you, you yeah. started this during the pandemic. So. Well, I wrote it during the pandemic, but I got the, I started the ideas for it 
like that pot on the stove needing to steep about three years before the pandemic. Right. Um, you were working on names. Yeah. And I, and knew, that sort of I knew that the house was there because much like you, like setting is very important to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had the character of the house of Galland before I had Olivia inside the house. And so I knew I had this house, but you know what it really was, was the garden door. Um, and so for me, I've always had this fascination with doors. Like the very first novel I always, I, I ever wrote was about a door. It was inspired when I was 19. And it, that, that novel was never published, thankfully, because it actually had no plot, but it had a door, right? And when I was 19, I, um, I passed, I remember so vividly. And that's really weird for me because I don't actually have a good memory. I think I spend too much of my time in fiction. I like don't, I'm not actually good at reality, but I remember walking home and you know, like when you see a, a wooden fence that has gaps and as you're walking, it kind of makes that like stop motion picture as you're walking past it, those little gaps. And I remember right. looking into a yard and there was a door standing upright in the yard as though the entire house around that door had been removed, but the door had been left. So it was a door in a door frame in the middle of an empty lot. And I just- Could, think, could not be more provocative, I know, right? I just, like, everything in my brain, like the what ifs just like started going off. But I couldn't bring myself, like all I wanted in that moment was to go into that yard and open the door. Because I was so convinced, this is, I'm 19, I'm so convinced that if I do, the thing I see on the other side of that door is not gonna be the yard. I'm just, I'm like dead set on this. And because of that, I couldn't bring myself to do it. Because I was so afraid, I think, I didn't wanna know that it was the yard on the other side. I didn't right. want it to be the yard. But this image stuck with me and stuck with me and stuck with me. And doors would go on this threshold obsession, this obsession with the liminal space would go on to inform almost every single one of my books. I mean, like everything, there would be physical doors, like the doors between worlds and shades of magic. And there would be metaphorical doors about the life and death side of like the villain series and City of Ghosts, there's the veil. So I really Our wanted life. to- yeah, archive, the archive so many doors. doors with the keys and yeah. almost, I mean every single book has doors and thresholds and I, I just really wanted to write this door and I was really much like that door standing up alone in the yard I was very taken with the idea of a wall with a door in it not four walls because really for a wall to be effective there have to be multiple of them and they have to connect but there's only one piece of wall just standing freeform the way that door had stood in when I was 19. And the idea that like, what is the point of a locked door in a wall that you can walk all the way around? That you can just walk around, yeah. yeah. Like she can look around the side of the wall and see the other side. So there should be no mystery there. But it was much like that door It was that I saw. It was just this fascination of like, but you know, if you open that door, it's not gonna be the same on the other side. And, and so that's really what I was fascinated. And but then I was like, well, what if it is at some times of day? Mm -hmm. What if, if you walk around the, you know, you go through the door or walk around the wall during the day, it's just a piece of ruin in the back of a yard. But if you go at night, it's something else. And it's that labyrinth moment when she goes into the labyrinth and then she turns and the doors are gone and the walls go on forever. And you're, and I, so I was really interested in this kind of like, you know, across the sunline of it all what mm -hmm. happens and the world is such a different place at night that I just needed to like all these things were just percolating in my head and was there a one single moment you started and never stopped or yes. yeah. I came up with the last page so I um I write the endings first Mm -hmm. uh, in my head, I don't have to put pen to paper, but I need to know exactly how the story ends uh, because I write toward that. Like for me, the ending to keep on with the food metaphor and the meal metaphor, like the ending is the taste left in your mouth at the end of the meal. For me, it's not just that, that last page, that last punctuation mark that you're writing toward, it's the culmination of everything. Mm -hmm. And so what I do is I come up with an ending that I feel is the culmination of everything. And then I rewind to figure out, okay, here's where the characters are when we leave them. So let's figure out who they need to be when we first meet them in order to get to this point. And I came up with 
finally, when I figured out exactly what the ending of Gallant looked like, the last scene, the last room, the last moment, and as soon as I knew what it was, I was like, oh, I can write this book now. Glad you did. <laughs> me too, me too. It's just, you know, it's just like an immense relief. Like, I wouldn't even call it joy. For me, it's just like, oh, thank God, there you are. <laughs> like, there you are. <laughs> For, for me, uh, the, the, the process is a little bit more like an internal movie. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a moment where the whole story sort of spools out in a very short period of time. It, and, and I can see everything that's, that's going to happen. Um, and then, you know, I take seven more years to finish writing it down. And can I really ask that, do you feel like you're executing a plan that's in your head? Because I also think about like playing a movie in my head. And then for me, the act of writing is transcribing that film in such a way that the same movie plays in the reader's head. A little bit like that. What I, what I see though, is a sort of omnipotent viewpoint. Okay. And what I have to do then after I've seen the movie in its entirety is figure out which character's viewpoint will give me as much as I can possibly get of the, the much larger universal sort of events that I've just enjoyed. Um, so, you know, if I tell it from this person's point of view, then I have to leave out that. And if I tell it from that person's point of view, I have yeah. to leave out. And there's all these sacrifices that have to be made. It, it's probably just that I make decisions really slowly. That's why it <laughs> takes me so long. Um, but then um, when I am first writing, I make a sketch, essentially. Really? And, and it's just a brief sketch of the entire story, just like somebody who, who first draws a, a picture on the camp, canvas in pencil and then goes back with oil paints. The first thing is just a sketch. And then I go back and paint the whole thing from beginning to end. And I do usually, I usually work from beginning to end, unlike some people who don't, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's it. Well, I will tell you, Gallant, so book number 21, very first time in my entire career that I wrote beginning to end. Once I had the ending, I went back to page one. And I think it's because it's a, it's a small book. Uh, and I mean, that in the, it's a linear, single perspective. And yes, it has the journal, but like, you know, I mean, you, you know, Patty was 300 years and two perspectives and Shades of Magic is like 12 perspectives and it goes back and forth. It's like it was, and I think because it's such an insular, I really wanted it to feel claustrophobic and like kind of unto itself. Mm -hmm. And so I think in order, I just like, I use the momentum of like, you know, that little snowball rolling down the hill and picking itself up. Like I went from beginning to end so that it would just like only amass in one direction as I was going. But much like you, like I need to have a sketch probably to be very honest, I need to have like undercoat paints and everything as well. I'm a very nervous person. And so like, I find that the more information I have going into the draft, the less terror I feel and the more like confidence I feel in my ability to do it. But well, the this sketch leads, is imperative. This leads to the question um, and we do need to wrap up soon. So the last two things I'm gonna ask you are, what are you working on now? How's that going? And also, can you talk a little bit about the tour? Sure. About, this is amazing. You're going to be in the Places. real world and you know, talk to real people. And I'm very know. envious. Um, traveling and things like that. So There's where are you gonna be? Chance. What's it gonna be like, do you think? Um, well, I got to do my first event actually um, a couple of days ago. And believe it or not, it was my very first Addie LaRue event in person. And the emotions that I felt, it was like 300 people in a library and like a year and a half after Addie LaRue hit shelves and every event for Addie has been virtual. And so that was deeply overwhelming and incredible. And like, I forgot, I forgot just how important it is to see faces. That was so nice. And then this, the Gallon tour is really interesting because essentially what we're doing is like 50-50. So mm -hmm. virtual in person, virtual in person. So I'm going to be going to DC and and do like an in person for like 150 something that's like whatever is safe for the capacity of the venue basically. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and then do virtual event and then go to Texas and then do a virtual event, go to Denver and then do a virtual event and then go to Tucson. So it feels very small for me because pre COVID I used to tour for like a month. Mm -hmm. And this is, I'm like, it's two weeks, but I'm already exhausted. And it's like the first night. <laughs> so I feel the thing I'm most stressed about is that uh, I have to wear hard pants. Like I have to wear pants with buttons and things on them instead of pajamas. <laughs> and I'm like really not feeling that light. <laughs> this is what I'm wearing right now is I have pajama bottoms on. And, yeah. and this is what I call like the pandemic mullet, right? Because um, like it's business up top and it's just right. party on the bottom. Yeah. I got my sweatpants on. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for I bringing that like, up. Yeah. I have to like, wear pants that have closures on them. And it's really stressful to me. My body's like, excuse you. We have adapted. My mom who lives in France, I, my mom has this incredible theory that like you know, in science fiction movies, we always see everyone has like flowing garments, like everyone in science fiction in the future, they're just like very, and she thinks that it's because they've been through a pandemic and like they just have decided. <laughs> nobody goes back to belt nobody buckles, goes back. zippers. No, yeah. not a zipper lifestyle anymore, but. Every time I do one of the Zoom events, yeah, I have to put earrings in. Oh man. And my ears are like, really? Your ears are like, do we have to do this? Do we have to have those in? Could we yeah. just take those back out again? Oh, so yeah, God. I'm very slowly getting used to having earrings in my, it was like a year without it's putting fair. earrings on it's or, fair. yeah. So, well, um, and as for what I'm working on, cool. Yeah. Well, um, I'm currently writing the fourth, I never know whether to call it the fourth book in the Shades of Magic series or the first book in the Threads of Power series. Cause it's the next arc. Mm -hmm. So Shades of Magic was the first three books Threads of Power is the next three books, and and I am like a word for this. There should be a word, second trilogy. But then I, I mean, really, you should just like it's a continuation. I, if I say second trilogy, people think it won't have the characters from Shades of Magic. But basically, if a character survived Shades of Magic, <laughs> they are like a main character. Spoilers. Yeah, they are a main character in Threads of Power. Um, I'm like hundred and thirty-five thousand words into the first book. It should have ended by now. It, it hasn't. So I don't know why that's the case, but, um, and I have a TV show coming out this summer. Yeah, you do. Exciting. How exciting is that? It's Terrifying, like, exciting, or just exciting, exciting? I mean, exciting, exciting. It's like really an education in like the idea that really we're playing gods as authors. Like we are in so much control. And then, uh, you know, anytime you move into a medium that costs so much more money, there's suddenly like a hundred cooks in the kitchen. So excitement, but also, you know, here's what it is. It's a fun show. Mm -hmm. It's like gay Buffy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like what I just really wish I had had as a teenager. I've talked about this before, but but one of the reasons I think it took me so long to figure out my identity um, is that like growing up, you know, if you were gay, it had to look a really specific way. You know, you were either like super butch or super femme. You mm -hmm. had to like have one of these two binary styles. And if you didn't fit into one of those categories, well, you must not be that thing. That's like how it felt in the nineties and the aughts. And so I think for a long time, I just didn't see I mean, it's the why representation matters, right? I didn't see anyone just like I acted or feel like I felt. And so it's called First Kill. And I just like to think that like maybe if teenage me had seen a show like this, I could have asked my questions I needed to ask of myself a little sooner. Or that probably. sounds, that sounds like a wonderful thing to bring into the world. Yeah, it's just super fun too. I mean, it's like, it's just, Dorky. like I like it it's like a drama but it's just it's it's campy and it makes me happy as I said a wonderful thing to bring into the world something that makes people happy and gives people something that they didn't know before yeah you know? and it, it really like I got to go to set and it, I think the most overwhelming thing was like talking to the kids the actors they are kids like I, I mean, they are all, but like, you know, so it follows like um, a vampire family and a vampire hunter family and the vampire hunter family is, is black and like talking to the three kids about like, they get to be like these just badass monster hunters and talking with them that like, 
you know, one of the guys, one of the brothers on the show, you know, he's like, I didn't get to see myself in one of these roles. Like he's a huge anime fan. He's a huge comics fan. And he's like, I would have liked this. And I got to, like, we were talking, I was like, but Dom, you realize like, you're going to be that for somebody. Like you're going to be the thing. You're going to be the badass monster hunter that like a kid gets to see and gets to cosplay. Cause I think cosplay becomes like one of the representational cues, right? Like, do you see people that excite you that you want to dress up as? And I was like, people are going to dress up as you. Like you, you get to be that for another generation. I think that's really what we're all here for. Yeah. Being something for the next generation that we wanted to see in our own. Exactly. exactly. It's, a, it's a great thing to be a writer and to be able to do that, isn't it? I think it's just incredibly powerful. And I feel incredibly lucky that I can do it with a, with a laptop and a keyboard. Yeah. And, and, John, and have all of that power at my fingertips. And I don't have to rope 350 other people and an entire special effects studio <laughs> into creating it. I can do it myself with a pencil and a piece of paper. And I just feel so lucky that of all of the mediums I could work in, media I could work in, yeah. I have this one. It's a great I can do all by myself when I want I to. Know. And yeah. you don't have to think, oh, wow, I didn't realize that scene was going to cost so much when I wrote it. <laughs> You're like, hey, oh. no, it's like 10 words on the piece of paper. I can, they can fly, they can disappear. They, they're gods, the you know? Incredible power of making stuff up. Yeah. Like what, like what a, I mean, what a brilliant, there's not a day that goes by that I do not just feel extremely lucky. Same. And on that note, yeah. I think we're going to wrap up. Yeah. And I'm, going to say again that all of those books you signed are going to be on their way and thank you all for coming and I hope you all enjoy Gallant by V.E. Schwab so thank you for talking to me I had a great time this was wonderful please let us meet in person soon yeah, okay soon very soon have a wonderful wow. night good night <laughs>